Hey, Pear fans. This episode is brought to you by Audible.com. If you like listening to beautiful voices like ours instead of reading words, then head on over to Audible where you get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash Truth, where you can choose from over 180,000 titles for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Since the fall of man, a war has raged between good and evil. Over the centuries, this war has distorted the truth. Now the truth is perceived as lies, and lies acknowledged as truth. To this day, the battle continues as we investigate and debate the truth behind the history and mystery of the universe. We are Paratruth Radio. Many have debated the source of creation, specifically humankind. While some point to evidence which support an intelligent, all-powerful creator God, others point to a highly advanced alien species that travels outer space with tremendous speed. Tonight, we take a look into the latter and ask, can civilization have been created by ancient aliens. Now Parachute presents The Sagan Conspiracy with special guest Don Zagudis. What's up, Para fans? Welcome to a brand new episode of Paratruth Radio. My name is Eric. And I'm Justin. And while you're listening to the show tonight, be sure to check out our website at paratruthradio.com where you can learn more about us and what we do. Also, feel free to look into our Patreon account at paratruthradio.com and help us to continue bringing the world fresh, entertaining media each and every week. By contributing, you'll become an executive producer of Paratruth Radio and officially become part of the Paratruth Radio family which will include special monthly behind-the-scenes to our productions. <laughs> Woo! That's always a good thing, you know? It's kind of cool because you guys don't get to see it, but the behind-the-scenes stuff is really fun. Uh, it's fun for us, and I think it'd be really fun for you guys to see what we do because uh, it's it, it's not that simple, really. So there's <laughs> a lot that goes into each production. Um, but yeah, Justin, man, how are you doing this week? Doing pretty good. Uh, Job's doing awesome. Getting stuff going for Paratruth Radio. Mm -hmm. Uh, Folks, if you didn't hear me last week, we are part of Fringe Radio Network now, uh, as well as our own special entity. So uh, it's awesome to be on with those those guys. And I do encourage all you guys to check out their all the shows that are on there they have cast them off radio they have la marzuli which i believe is um ascension radio i want to i want to say i'm okay i can't remember for sure i should always just have that pulled up but uh check those guys out at fringe radio network.com for sure um you know it's really a cool thing i know we said it last week but it's a cool thing that uh, someone would approach us uh to join their team you know it's really fun we've already got some ideas into the future uh in support of fringe radio and in support of us as well so we'll definitely keep you all we'll keep you all in uh participation with that um because we really do want you guys the listeners to actually participate and become a part of Paratruth Radio. So it's not just us talking to you, but it's us talking with you. Mm. Uh, so before we jump into the, the show, I just want to encourage everyone, if you have any questions, you have any ideas or thoughts uh, or concerns or anything like that regarding a specific episode or as the show uh, or for the show as a whole, feel free to reach out to us. Email us at paratruthradio at gmail.com. Of course, hit us up on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And there's also, I think, if I'm not mistaken, there's also a contact uh, on paratruthradio.com. So you can just go in there, you know, click your info, send us a message. We'd love to hear from you and would love to talk with you. Folks, there have long been arguments between scientists as to the source of creation. One such subject is that of ancient aliens. 
Some believe that these ancient aliens not only paved the road of civilization, but that they are also the authors of many of today's religions. Now, the question we must ask ourselves is whether there can be any truth to this claim or if it's simply a path to deception. Tonight, we travel the road of ancient aliens through the eyes of Carl Sagan with our guest, Don Zagudis. Don, welcome to the show. Thank you. Before we go ahead and get into uh, the book here, why don't you give our listeners a little information about yourself? Or where do you come from? What's your background? Sure. Um, I live in Central Oregon uh, in high desert country. I've been here for uh, about 50 years, so I'm not a spring chicken anymore. I have a, a degree in theology and education from Corbin University uh, in Salem, Oregon. I did my master's work at uh, Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon, and uh, on this particular research, that was the basis for the book, but they did not allow me to write my master's thesis because they deemed it too controversial, and uh, I've been a, a student of Carl Sagan for, um, golly, for 40, 50 years. Uh, I've learned uh, a, a lot from him. I... Uh, uh, most importantly, how the scientific method works. And along the way, I learned a lot about Carl Sagan, uh, uh, his uh, interest and his belief in ancient alienism. And uh, about 10 years ago, I was very fortunate to come across a book called Civilized Life in the Universe by George Basala. And in that book, uh, George talked about a scientific article that Carl Sagan wrote back in 1962 at Stanford University. I had never heard of it before, and uh, the paper was with a NASA grant. It was a pro-ancient alien paper. It, it was uh, sub subsequently peer-reviewed and published in a scientific journal. And so uh, I went ahead and tried to get my hands on that paper, and after several attempts working with research librarians, I was able to get it. And that was uh, kind of the start of how I started putting this book together. Sounds like a, a rabbit hole that you didn't really intend to go to at first, but um, <clears throat> so. Uh, oh, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> How did you actually come across this? I mean, I, I know that uh, you go to it in, in the book, uh, but the the Sagan um, paper was actually kind of buried to where you couldn't find it at first, right? Uh, I have yet to find anybody. Uh, in the ancient alien community or in the mainstream community who has told me, Don, we knew all about the paper all along. We've written about it. We've been talking about it. Uh, it's, it's a remarkable incident because um, uh, it's there. It's in the NASA files. Uh, it's, it's in my book in its totality. Uh, you can now get it online if you go to Wikipedia. Uh, it's just been added to Wikipedia recently, thanks to my book. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, this paper, which is a 14-page document uh, with full footnotes, it's a solid science-based academic paper advocating the, uh, the hypothesis that Earth has been visited by extraterrestrials in, the, uh, in antiquity, that the uh, uh, extraterrestrials introduced civilization to the Sumerians, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's a remarkable document. It should be a cornerstone document for all ancient alien research going forward. I mean, this is the foundation. Uh, it's written by a mainstream scientist, a famous scientist. It was peer-reviewed and published. It's got all the gravitas, all the credentials necessary. So this should be our foundational document uh, for all ancient alien enthusiasts. Okay. Now, the ancient alien theory, uh, you know, it's pretty interesting and it's starting to get uh, relatively widespread, but not nearly as spread as, say, the Gospels and much of the religions. Now, I recall hearing on an episode that you did with Jim Harold that one belief is that these uh, ancient aliens had created the religions that we know today and that they were kind of the source of the religions. But now there's many scientists uh today, which, you know, there's articles out there, they've been on TV, so on and so forth, while trying to figure out the true uh, beginning of civilization, 
they find that the evidence points to a creator God as opposed to the ancient aliens. So in what way does the evidence from Sagan or just your own uh, research, in what way does the evidence differ in does it only differ by opinion or like what really makes someone decide, oh, this is God or, oh, this is these ancient aliens? Well, that's a great question. And, and really, I haven't been asked that before. So I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity to respond. Uh, uh, this is a little bit of science philosophy, but uh, science views the universe as a enclosed space and uh, religion, particularly Western religion, sees God as over and above and outside that space, and he has intervened into that space to create the universe or to create man and so on. Uh, according to a, a, a long-standing scientific principle that goes back hundreds of years called the uniformity of science, uh, the laws and principles that govern the universe are the same here on Earth and throughout the entire universe. And if you have a God from outside the universe come into the universe and do so much as move a grain of sand, all of a sudden that undermines everything that science is about. Nothing that science advocates can be considered totally true if all of a sudden you have a deity from outside the universe intervening in the universe. And this is where extraterrestrials come in because extraterrestrials have evolved from within the universe. They haven't come from outside the universe. The fact that they have evolved and that they're perhaps a million or millions of years ahead of us in science and technology, and that they came to Earth and introduced uh, civilization to humankind or even created humankind, that is scientifically acceptable. And so that's the difference between the religious side and you know the ancient alien side. Now, if I may ask uh, real quick, now you say that science uh, indicates that there's a – that space is – we live in a closed space, right? But yet right. we have been unable to reach the furthest ends of space. We have no clue how far beyond it goes. So how do they conclude that everything is exactly just as they say without ever reaching the ends of space and not knowing what is beyond? Well, that's another great question. Uh, there is a theory called the, the multiverse theory where there's a, a infinite number of universes. However, we do know that uh, 14 and a half billion years ago, there was a big bang. And at the big bang, there was an expansion. And uh, so uh, we have an idea of how big our universe is and even what the shape is. It's, uh, we know that it's, it's an expanding universe and it's uh, 14 and a half billion light years across. So we know a lot about the age, the size, the shape of the universe, and we're still learning more. So to answer your question, I think that uh, I think we do have a pretty good handle on this thing that we call our universe. All right. Well, one thing that I started to, to think of when I was reading this book is uh, a lot of people believe in ancient alienism. They also believe that extraterrestrials are visiting us regularly now, which I, I don't say that they are, they aren't because there are sightings everywhere nowadays. Uh, but a lot of people believe that there are extraterrestrials in league with the human governments. Did Carl Sagan's paper or even anything that you found on him indicate that he believed that as well? Not that particular point, but he did believe uh, that Earth has been visited many, many times by extraterrestrials in the geological past. In fact, he even put a number on. He said 10,000 times, which is a, you know, when you stop to think about it, 10,000 visits over geological time. The Earth is four and a half billion years old. So if they came, you know, anywhere close to that number of times, what were they doing? Was it just a flyby? Or were they terraforming our planet and our solar system, getting it ready for the advent of life and eventually human life? Uh, and, uh, and then he also believed that extraterrestrials interacted with humans uh, in historical times, and that goes back to the Sumerian connection. Uh, it, we have to say that if extraterrestrials have been here in the past on a regular basis, there's no reason to expect that they wouldn't still be coming, you know, on a regular basis today. In fact, according to Carl Sagan, 
the more advanced that humans got, the more frequent would be the visitations. He never said that he believed that there were extraterrestrials now on Earth moving around, but he did talk about a potential of extraterrestrials coming back in the future to see how we're doing and if we qualify for what he called the Galactic Confederation or if we're too stupid or too dumb or too ignorant to realize that we need to come together as a species and quit bickering between all the races and creeds and everything like that and take care of our planet and do things that make sense that would qualify us to become a part of the Galactic Federation. So kind of like a Star Trek feel, if you will, right? Right, and uh, uh, science-based, uh, something that uh, makes sense from a scientific perspective, and, uh, and, and that's what Carl was about. He was not into generating narratives, that, and this is what ancient alien, conventional ancient alienists do. They look around the world for archaeological, geological, historical curiosities, and when they find them, they create a narrative around them that involves extraterrestrials. Uh, that's uh, maybe one way to look for, uh, for, for the smoking gun. Mm. Uh, Carl didn't think it was a very good way. He believed that the scientific way was to pick the best uh, lead that you have and then very persistently dig down as deeply as you can into that until you either hit a brick wall or you find a smoking gun. Okay. Now, interestingly, much of the ancient alien theory suggests that the aliens, you know, they're from an, either another universe or another galaxy or what whatnot, and so they must be able to travel at let's say, light speeds. Now, as far as I know, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but science is yet to determine exactly how fast light moves, specifically and how we can move as fast, uh, because there's no exact determination or way to determine how fast light is because we can't be in two places at one time. Light moves that quick. So with that said, and if indeed we don't have the scientific evidence to support just exactly how fast it's moving, how is it tangible to believe that these aliens are moving so quick if there's no real evidence to support it? Does, not, does that not take faith in and of itself? Um, I want to correct you. Uh, okay. my, my understanding is that we do know how fast uh, light moves. It moves at 186,000 miles a second. And mm -hmm. this, is, this has been verified many, many times over. So, uh, And another thing, uh, extraterrestrials do not have to move at the speed of light to uh, – to colonize our galaxy. In fact, uh, on the uh, SETI Institute website, where the, uh, if you go to uh, the Fermi's paradox, they now admit that uh, the Earth, uh, the the our our galaxy is uh, is is 14 and a half billion years old. Earth is only four and a half billion years old. And according to the Drake equation, there are probably thousands of advanced extraterrestrial civilizations within the Milky Way galaxy, if they only traveled at 10% of the speed of light, they by now should have explored the entire Milky Way galaxy and have visited Earth. So, uh, uh, you know, even NASA and SETI admit that now. So uh, the fact that, uh, that for 30 years, NASA basically promoted the big lie that uh, extraterrestrials would have to move at or close to the speed of light in order to get to Earth, and that's just absolutely not true, and now they admit it's not true. Well, if I may ask, and th this is something that is pretty common, I think, that they teach within high schools and even colleges, is the supposed fact that the light that we see from stars and from other planets, the distant galaxies, that light that we're seeing is a possible indication that that planet or star is no longer there, and that it takes the light that long to get here. But if the light moves as fast as you're saying, that would suggest that the light we're seeing from the stars are indeed the exact same star that we're seeing in the same time, in the same period as we're seeing it. No? No, you're, no, you're correct. The okay. light that we see from a distant star, if it takes uh, 10 million years to get here, what we're really looking at is the star as it existed 10 million years ago. And it, today it may not even be there. But if you look at uh, the... Uh, uh, the age of the universe, and we're talking, and the age of the galaxy, and we're talking about billions of years. If extraterrestrials, advanced extraterrestrials, were to have left their home planet, say, 
uh, 100 million years ago, which is really a, a cosmic second on the cosmic clock. And if they would have had just started going out and, uh, again, we're talking about immortals here, people mm -hmm. that have solved the, the riddle of immortality. And so we're, they're out expanding through the, through the galaxy, uh, going from one star system to another. They should have already colonized or explored the entire galaxy. They've had plenty of time to do that, moving at much less than the speed of light. Okay. All right, folks, uh, before we get too much further into it, we're going to take our first break here. You've been listening to Paratruth Radio. We're talking to Don Zagudis about his book, The Sagan Conspiracy. But first, Eric's Random Fact of the Day. Now, Eric's Random Fact of the Day. What's up, Paratruthers? Most of us know how easy it seems to be to gain weight. And surely, counting calories is difficult, especially when so many people like sugar. But did you know that on average, people worldwide consume 500 extra calories a day from eating sugar? Believe it or not, according to Factslides.com, 500 calories is roughly the amount of calories needed to gain a pound of weight each day. So the next time you look at a candy bar, or think about adding sugar to your coffee, ask yourself if putting on a pound of weight is really your goal this week. This was Eric's Random Back to the Day. All right, folks, welcome back to Paratruth Radio. My name is Justin. And I'm Eric. And we've been talking to Don Zagudis about his book, The Sagan Conspiracy. Now, Don, we've been talking about the, the whole ancient alien uh, uh, theory, and I, I know Carl was a huge believer in that. But, uh, I mean, the book is called The Sagan Conspiracy. What was the conspiracy? The conspiracy was a cover-up. Uh, uh, in 1960 to 1962, um, there, uh, Frank Drake, who was a radio uh, astronomer, he came up with the idea of using radio telescopes to intercept potential alien signals that were being beamed our way. Mm -hmm. And it was based upon a uh, paper uh, by two uh, scientists at Cornell University. And uh, it, w uh, it was a, a it received NASA approval, and uh, that particularly st particular strategy was uh, was incorporated. Uh, at that same time, Carl Sagan was thinking that uh, the chances of a radio telescope intercept was extremely small. That the odds uh, were that extraterrestrials, if they exist, have already been to Earth, and so as an alternative strategy. He thought it better to look for evidence that uh, here on Earth, that they have been here on Earth. And that was what his paper was about. In science, competition is extremely important. Um, you always encourage competition because that brings out the best, That you know, in sports as well, and really mm -hmm. anything. And here, there were two competitive strategies, one space-based, one Earth-based. And Carl Sagan didn't have any problem at all implementing the radio telescope strategy, even though he didn't think it would work, he thought, well, you know, let's, it, we can do it. Let's go ahead and try it. But at the same time, let's have some competition. And he was in favor of, ha of, of leading a team of scientists that would be looking here on Earth for evidence that extraterrestrials have been here on Earth. That was the scientifically right thing to do, and NASA would not allow it. They went with a single strategy, which is very, very unscientific. They buried... Carl Sagan's Stanford paper. Uh, they did not properly adjudicate it like they would normal, normally with papers that have been peer-reviewed and published. Uh, very quickly, it became uh, basically an unknown paper. Uh, it was not talked about at different conferences, SETI conferences, or things like that. And so uh, it really, uh, over, the, over a 50-year period, it was basically like a lost paper. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and and now uh, I'm very honored to be able to, to 
say that, you know, here it is, uh, I'm presenting it to the world. I've gotten tremendous compliments for bringing it forward after it has been essentially suppressed and lost. And, and that was not unintentional. It was an intentional suppression. And that's what I claim was the conspiracy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, now, if I'm not mistaken, the radio telescoping in which they're trying to uh, Sigma is trying to uh, receive some sort of communication from outer space that never happened. Why do you think that is? Well, uh, I think Carl Sagan was right. Uh, he thought that uh, if there are intelligent, uh, uh, advanced extraterrestrials in our galaxy, and uh, and they uh, were to send a radio telescope message, and you pointed this out earlier, mm -hmm. if they were 10,000 light years away from us, which is, you know, not, you know, very possibly it could be that or even more, it would take 10,000 years for their message to get here to Earth. And then if we were to intercept it and decrypt it and respond, it would take another 10,000 years for us to get our message back to them. And Carl Sagan, and he, and he had a dry sense of humor and, and a lot of wit. He said, that's really not a good way to carry on a conversation. He, yeah. uh, he said, uh, he said uh, you know, it would be much, uh, make much more sense for the extraterrestrials to simply come here and to speak to us directly and to instruct us directly. And uh, that's why SETI, uh, as Carl Sagan predicted, has been a failure. Uh, they still have their radio telescopes. They're still trying to make contact. A Russian billionaire, Yuri uh, Milner, has, uh, as last year, he dedicated $100 million to SETI to try to see if they could upgrade their, 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 their equipment and, and hire more people uh, to try to get this thing resolved within the next uh, 10 years. Uh, I don't think it's going to be successful. In fact, I know it won't be. Uh, the bottom line is, is that uh, SETI is a failed experiment. Hmm. Now, the one thing that I found kind of fascinating, because uh, I have listened to you on a couple of different shows, was that uh, you talked about Carl Sagan possibly being assassinated. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, and and that's a, you know, that's a, that's a sensational claim, and 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 I don't make it lightly. At the same time, in my book, I say I have no smoking gun evidence. I, I can't prove it, but there's a set of circumstances that that does make me wonder. Carl Sagan was a picture of health. Uh, he was, uh, he was, uh, athletic. Uh, he was, uh, he kept a tremendous work schedule that few people could keep up with. And at the, uh, when he was uh, 60 years old, he uh, all of a sudden contracted this very rare form of cancer, a uh, myelodysplasia. And two years later he was dead. And, uh, and he died in 1996. So we're just celebrating the 20th anniversary of his death. And uh, at 62 years of age, it was just a remarkable loss to humanity. And uh, shortly after Carl Sagan died, uh, NASA, with the Pentagon backing, starts, uh, started two programs to develop interstellar spaceflight capability by the end of this century. Uh, one is called uh, Icarus Interstellar, and the other one is called the 100-Year Starship Project. And you can go on their websites and find some amazing things. But the whole reason for rejecting Carl Sagan's paper was they claimed, NASA claimed, that interstellar space flight was impossible both for humans and for aliens for all time. This was Frank Drake's uh, position as well. He, and basically Frank Drake said, you know, we're not going to waste time looking for aliens here on Earth because it's impossible. They they could physically they could never have have made it here. And so all of a sudden we are now developing interstellar spaceflight capabilities now that Carl Sagan is dead. Uh, myelodysplasia, the disease that he died from, uh, <clears throat> one of the things that can cause it is a trace amounts of a radioactive substance and uh, like polonium-210. And uh, it's almost a perfect way to assassinate somebody because it has a very short half-life. So by the time you expose somebody to it, and then they contract cancer, and actually Carl died from pneumonia, which was a complication from his cancer two years later, 
If they would have given him an autopsy when he died, they would not have found any traces of polonium-210 because, because of the short half-life. So it's like the perfect way to execute somebody. So what I'm saying is that there's a set of circumstances that it made it very convenient for Carl Sagan to die when he did so that NASA and the Pentagon could proceed with their plans to uh, go to Mars and then even beyond. If they would have uh, done that before Carl Sagan died, Carl Sagan could have rightly said, hey, if we're doing it, then extraterrestrials more advanced than us should have been doing it for a long time and they should have made it to Earth. And that would have given his paper, you know, the full legitimacy that it deserves. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> in regards to uh, government technology, just the technology that we have today, uh, there's obviously many claims that the technology we have, especially like stealth jets, uh, comes from ancient aliens or aliens that have recently appeared, such as in 1947 with the Roswell crash, if, you know, if that's legitimate, which, you know, governments haven't really come out to state whether or not they found anything. There's been claims back and forth. And there's been a lot of arguments. But based on your research, because I know you've done a whole lot more research than I have when it comes to <laughs> aliens. Is there any significant evidence, a substantial evidence that does support the fact that the government may be using some kind of alien technology today? And is there any possibility that what we're hearing is simply just conspiracy and that's it and no one really knows well uh justin i, I think that uh you know you're selling yourself a little bit short you probably know more about ancient alienism than i do uh, i am really focused uh, specifically on what carl sagan did and his strategy of of the sumerian model uh, and uh but what you're referring to is uh, uh i refer it to you know to the uh to the Roswell model, and uh, which basically advocates that there are uh, aliens today with advanced technology, and somehow the government was able to get its hands on some of that, that technology and use it to develop the stealth uh, uh, hardware that they have, uh, Area 51 and so on. I find that an intriguing uh, argument. Uh, I have looked at a number of programs like you have and probably the listeners have as well. And uh, some of it seems to be compelling. Some of the witnesses seem to be compelling. But uh, the bottom line is, is that science needs uh, replicable and, and testable evidence. Uh, you know, and really, uh, up to this time, uh, nobody's picked up an alien body and taken it to a lab for, you know, for independent testing. Uh, nobody has really captured a flying saucer or, as uh, SETI says, uh, nobody's even captured a landing light that's fallen off a flying saucer that they could take to the labs and test. So uh, I remain a skeptic, but at the same time, I, I, I applaud those who are doing the research and looking into it. Uh, I feel that the Sagan strategy is far more likely to uh, produce results. In fact, I'm, I feel very confidently that within the next few years, uh, using the Sagan strategy, that the smoking gun will be found and we'll have scientific evidence that Earth is a visited planet. So I, I know you have a second book coming out because you're doing a sequel to this. Uh, but in in your hopeful opinion, what do you want people to take from uh, this book and specifically even just the, the Sagan paper? Well, one of the things, uh, and I've been uh, – this has been pointed out to me many times, and that is a, a lot of people think that Carl Sagan was uh, was a, a, a huge opponent of ancient alienism. In fact, uh, <clears throat> he was. Uh, he, he spent a lot of time uh, exposing people like Eric von Daniken and Zachariah Sitchin and others as, as basically a pseudoscience. And it's important for uh, your listeners to understand that Carl Sagan was attacking their methodology, not their premise. Uh, he agreed with the underlying premise that extraterrestrials have been to Earth. But he thought, if we're going to nail this down scientifically, uh, the way that conventional ancient alienism is doing it is not the right way to go. It has to be done scientifically. And Carl Sagan was a mainstream scientist. That's 
that's where he got his paycheck from, from NASA. He was the face and voice of NASA and SETI for 30 years. Uh, he was a international spokesman for NASA and for space research. So he was a practicing scientist. And so it would have been very, very dangerous. In fact, it would have been suicidal for him to cross over that line and to uh, become an, uh, an advocate for ancient alienism the way that, say, Eric von Daniken or Zachariah Sitchin became. Uh, and so that was why he attacked their methodology, but he believed in the underlying premise. So I'd like to have that as one takeaway. And the other thing is a very hopeful and optimistic thing that, and you pointed out that uh, I'm working on a second book, and it's, it's going to be very exciting when it comes out, and I can't give you a date yet or, or anything, I can tell you anything about it. But I think that we have a, a foundation, we have a platform for a new line of research, a new strategy that's separate from the conventional ancient alien strategy that you see on the History Channel or, say, in the tabloids. It's, it's very uh, scientifically rigid. It adheres to scientific principles of, of, of uh, evidence, and I think that's the way we have to go, and I think that's what's going to be productive. Well, one thing I have to say is I've never been a fan of the Ancient Aliens show on the History Channel. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got I to gotta tell you, I, I can watch it for uh, maybe a half hour, then my brain starts to turn to mush. Right, yeah. <laughs> That's like, I mean, it's, it's basically brain shut-off viewing is what it yeah. is. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> Although I do have to say, one thing I give them credit for is they've kept the subject alive for many, many years without them the subject would probably have basically gotten off the grid, off the radar. Nobody would be talking about it. So I give them a lot of credit for keeping it in front of people and, and talking about it and thinking about it. And I think that's an important contribution. For, yeah, for sure. Um, I think final question here. Uh, when it comes down to it, the theory that we have in regards to ancient aliens at the moment is pretty much simply just a theory. We don't have an exact 100% answer. What do you think is the type of evidence that you would need, at least one piece, that would really help jump that theory to becoming a solid piece of evidence to support any and all claims of ancient alienism? Okay. Uh, the evidence is has to be recognized by the scientific community as credible evidence, and it has to be replicable meaning that uh, whatever it is, you can turn it over to NASA and say, okay, here it is. And NASA has to say, okay, uh, we can test it. Uh, what you've given us is credible evidence. We can test it and then proceed with testing. And the test results come back and say, yes, this is uh, to a scientific certainty. This is evidence that extraterrestrials exist and have been to Earth. Now, what specifically that evidence is, it could be a, a, a broad range of things. Uh, I have my own you know, particular speculations, and that goes back to Carl Sagan's belief that the uh, extraterrestrials appeared to the Sumerians. So I think that's the line of research that I'm doing that I believe will produce the kind of evidence that you're talking about. But in the bottom line, you have to be able to surrender that over to science. Science has to be able to independently do blind studies, independent studies, and the results have to come back affirmative. And that's what would seal the deal. All right. All right, uh, Don, I think we have gotten the best we can with you. It's been a great show, but uh, it is time to let you go. So I wanted to give you a chance to tell everybody where they can find you, find the book, and any other information you want to give out. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, you can get it on Amazon or you can get it... Uh, uh, at any uh, uh, Barnes & Noble or any independent bookstores. If they don't have it on the shelf, they can order it for you. Uh, it's also available in audio on Kindle and Nook. And by the way, if it's an audio, you won't get the uh, Stanford paper, uh, but you can get that, uh, again, you can get that at Wikipedia or uh, other places online. Uh, you can uh, get a hold of me uh, on my website, thesakenconspiracy.com. You can uh, find me on Facebook and Twitter. And, uh, and uh, if you want to uh, email me, uh, my email is don.zagudis at gmail.com. And so uh, there's multiple ways to uh, we can connect, and I, I'd be pleased to, to hear from your uh, audience. 
All right. Sounds good. Yeah. All right, Don. Thanks so much for coming on and uh, taking time out of your day to talk to us. And uh, as soon as that new book comes out, definitely let us know. We'd love to get you back on for that. But until then, have a good night and uh, hopefully talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Enjoy right. it very much. Okay. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, folks. That was Don Zagudis on his book, The Sagan Conspiracy. And, of course, he talked about the ancient aliens as well, the ancient alien theory. Me and Justin aren't done just yet. We will be back soon to continue the show but first, we're going to take a quick break and jump to Justin's Paranormal Headlines. And now, and now Parachute, Parachute Radio's, Radio's Paranormal, Paranormal Headlines. 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 What's shaking, Parafans? Justin here with your Paranormal Headlines, and these headlines are from unexplainedmysteries.com. Dolphin in Australia is found wearing a shirt. Wildlife officials are investigating reports of a dolphin that was spotted wearing some sort of garment. The Department of Parks and Wildlife was first alerted to the peculiar incident by the Dolphin Discovery Center after a member of the public took photographs of the animal. It was spotted around Kumbana Bay, Bunbury, with what looked like a shirt wrapped around its body and dorsal fin. It remains unclear how it ended up with the item of clothing, however officials have been treating the case as suspicious and believe that someone put it on the animal deliberately. The sighting is of concern because the shirt could ultimately cause the dolphin to suffocate. Interfering with marine mammals in this way is also illegal and can fetch up to a $4,000 fine. James Cameron finds evidence of Atlantis. The famous movie director has linked the discovery of Bronze Age anchors to the legend of Atlantis. Famously documented by the Greek philosopher Plato, Atlantis was said to be a continent situated in the middle of the Atlantic that was inhabited by a highly advanced and prosperous civilization. According to legend, the Atlanteans ultimately fell out of favor with the gods and the entire island was submerged beneath the waves. Real world theories suggest that if Atlantis did exist, it may have been sunk by a tsunami, a sustained period of volcanism, or some other ancient disaster. Whether or not Atlantis was a real place, however, has long remained a matter of heated debate. One prominent figure who has long been intrigued by the mystery is filmmaker James Cameron, who has been investigating the legend as part of a new TV documentary entitled Atlantis Rising. During the program, the investigation team made a particularly intriguing discovery in the form of six anchors dating back over 4,000 years. Found just outside the entrance to the Mediterranean, the anchors have been tentatively linked to the existence of Atlantis. These anchors could be 3,500 to 4,000 years old and establish a harbor in the Atlantic where I didn't even dare dream to find anchors, said filmmaker Simcha Jacobovici. It's easier to find a needle in a haystack than Bronze Age anchors in the Atlantic. Whether the anchors really did have something to do with Atlantis, however, remains unclear. And this has been Justin with your Paranormal Headlines. This was a segment of Parachute Radio's Paranormal Headlines. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages? Welcome back to a brand new episode of Paratruth Radio. My name is Eric. And I'm Justin. And we just got off the line with with Don Zagudis and his book, The Sagan Conspiracy. Right there, Justin is holding it up if you're watching YouTube. If not, again, Sagan Conspiracy. Check it out. Uh, Interesting conversation, interesting book, interesting theory. Now, Mm. Ancient Aliens, Justin, you and I both know, and I'm sure many of our listeners do know, Ancient Aliens is a pretty controversial subject, especially for those uh, in regards to the Christian community and the Christian science community and then that of just the scientific and atheistic uh, community as well. It's interesting because some of the things he said, such as the amount of time to be able to to move throughout our space – uh, the idea, and it, it was kind of a concept that I thought about when he was talking about it, but you know, he was saying that these aliens 
would show up from time to time and would become more frequent. But if I'm not mistaken, in order for that to happen, especially through the past with ancient aliens, uh, such as the Sumerians and so on and so forth, the aliens would have to show up at just the right moment in order to help people along or to know that something's happening or about to happen, that we're getting more advanced and so on and so forth. But that only really comes, as far as I know, because there's no way to possibly test it scientifically or in any other way, but they would have to have some kind of omniscience, be all-knowing, be able to know what's happening at any given time. Mm. It depends. It depends on what what is really going on. Like, if they passed the first time, let's say it was before the Sumerians. If they passed the first time and they saw that uh, we had some type of... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Some type of of uh, technology or well, just way to to them be peaceful enough or uh, whatever for them to contact us. If they saw mm-hmm. that, which I don't know what they would have seen to to think that they might have left something behind to monitor our. Uh, continuation Mm -hmm. uh, on this earth. Uh, So technically they wouldn't have had to be omniscient to do that if they had left something behind. I'm not saying they did, they didn't, but I don't think they would have to be godlike to do that if they had left something behind to to monitor us. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting though is that if this conspiracy or this – sorry, not conspiracy, but this theory, though some can argue it's a conspiracy, <laughs> um, if this theory were true, that would have – that would suggest that there has to be more than one race of alien life out there. And they can't all possibly be the exact same. What would make them so much better than us and mm-hmm. vice versa? You know. Um, so at what point do you think that we can scientifically prove, oh, it's this race or that race or such and such? Because we have the rays, the, the grays, the grays, supposedly, the reptilians, you know. I mean, it, it's interesting. It really is an interesting concept. But in regards to scientific evidence and being able to scientifically say, hey, this is this is the theory and here's why, we have yet to actually make contact with an alien species in order to support the scientific theory. Right now, they're just questions with very right. few answers. Well, um, it, and again, not to cut you off on this, but uh-uh. I, 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 I really agree with you here as far as um, evidence is concerned. All it is is <clears throat> hypothetical theory. Right. Now, in that of itself can be considered a type of evidence. Like, for example, if you brought this to a court system it would be it w- would be a type of evidence but it would not be like uh don said the smoking gun that there really right. was ancient aliens that came to earth uh i honestly and he talked about the the show on history channel now a lot of times like he said they go back to a certain point in history or a monument or something like that and say Hey, this could not have done been done without some type of intervention. Right. Yes, and no, I can understand where they're coming from there, but um, again, there's no evidence to say that humanity did not have the technology or the means to do things. For example, the pyramids or mm-hmm. the uh, the the Sphinx. Yes. To our knowledge, they did not have the means or technology to do that, but that doesn't mean that somewhere buried deep is is the means and technology that they had to do that. So, Mm -hmm. in my opinion, it's not necessary for ancient aliens to exist for us to do that. Is it possible that ancient aliens did visit us? Maybe, but, you know, that kind of puts into question what God is or who God is and that sort of a thing. Right. You know, it, it's interesting because you know, something that Jesse Marcel Jr. told me once on Forgotten Truth Radio, uh, he said that to say aliens exist could be to tell a lie and therefore be deceitful. But to say they don't exist would be to limit the power of God 
and his ability to create whatever he wants to create at any time throughout the universe. With that said, I think it's interesting because mankind wants to place everything in a bubble. That's that's what we're doing here, I think, with this particular theory of ancient aliens, because science will only science only works if it's tangible. Right. Mm. If we can only actually see it, we can touch it. We could, you know, somehow scientifically manipulate it and make it or learn about it, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we have to learn from something, but it has to be tangible, which is why we live in this box, such as uh, Don was just telling us, you know, in, in order for it to work sp- Space and science has to live within this shielded environment, you know. Uh, but what's interesting is when we jump to the Bible, and I'm just going to jump to the Bible here. Zophar rebukes Job because at the, t- the time Job is really upset because of his big loss that God had taken from him. Uh, he lost his family, lost his pets, lost his home, lost all kinds of stuff. And the Bible says in Job chat, uh, verse 7, he says, Zophar says, can you discover the depths of God? Can you discover the limits of the Almighty? They're as high as the heavens. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol, which is the grave. What can you know? Romans 11.33, this is New Testament, by the way. The apostle says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. It's interesting to me with these because they're very specifically telling us that we cannot find God by simple means. We can't search him out. We can't use science. We can't fathom him. Another version in regards to this, this, uh, this rebuke against Job, it actually says in the new test, uh, the NIV version, can you fathom the mysteries of God? And the New Living Translation, can you solve the mysteries of God? The indication here is no, we can't do it, not by human means. So I think, again, I don't think, um, I can't say that aliens don't exist. And by many means, I want to believe they do. I think it'd be kind of cool. (laughs) But to believe that they are in some way a God in and of themselves, you know, or that they have created mankind or have led a certain ways, I think is it's a little tough for me personally to grasp. Now, whether or not evidence will come out sometime in the future, who will, we're bound to find out, right? Right. But there's no sci- There's no way to scientifically prove God any more so than there's any scientific way to prove that there are <laughs> aliens or ancient aliens that have come to this earth. <laughs> it would be hard for any faithful person to grasp that we were created by another being other than an omnipotent being. Mm -hmm. And that goes for pretty much all religions that, you know, we came from some, we didn't come from aliens. We came from something that is all knowing, all powerful. Um, I don't know for sure, you know, where we came from. All I know is what I believe. And all you can go back to for God or aliens is faith or theory. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. that's all we have right now. Is it going to ever come out even in our lifetimes? Who knows? But, right. I mean, honestly, it's it's hard to prove one way or the other that God exists or that aliens exist. I'm not saying that mm-hmm. either don't exist. but And the only way to prove that, for example, God is, exists is by faith and Knowing that the Bible is his word and that uh, he, you know, there's no way that all of this could be spinning without some higher uh, being or power to to create it all. Um, right. In in the opposite side, I, I can't say aliens do or don't exist, but I f- also feel that it would be very close minded to think that we were the only ones to be alive in this entire universe of planets and suns. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I can't say that they do exist. I, I believe they exist, but I can't prove that they exist. Right. Well, nonetheless, this has been a very interesting topic and I'm glad we, we got Don on. I'm glad we talked to him about this because I know it's something that our listeners are interested in. I know it's something that many of them even question. Mm-hmm. And so for those of you listening today or at any time, uh, 
I hope that you got some answers here and, you know, whatever in whatever way you're going here. Uh, I'm glad you guys tuned in. I'm glad you guys continually tune in because without you guys, we, we wouldn't have a show straight yeah. up. Um, and so, again, if you guys have any questions, any concerns, any thoughts, ideas, whatnot, uh, maybe you have your own theory. Feel free to drop us a line at paratruthradio at gmail.com or, of course, find us on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, of course, definitely paratruthradio.com, your, one, your one-time stop for everything paranormal right there. Uh, we got answers if you need them. So feel free to hit us up. Um, future events. What do we got going next week, Justin? Next week, we're going to be actually talking to a friend of ours, John Mallard. Uh, he's in a group that you and I are a part of. And he's got a podcast called The Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast. Uh, but he's actually got an interesting story about his father and um, how the power of prayer helped him. Cool. And he thought that what better place to do that than on a show that has both mainstream and Christian views to, to, to bring them together, so to speak, in one particular <laughs> hey, way. And, you know, it's I mean, where light meets darkness on this show. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> bring it together. And, I mean, we've actually talked about this, uh, the power right. of prayer. But uh, mm-hmm. it'll be interesting to get somebody on to hear him talk or hear him tell the story about his father and how that actually helped him. It'll be, in my opinion, a solidifying aspect of how prayer can help. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That would be great. I'm looking forward to that. New to Paranormal News, coming at you from Paratruth Radio. It's our own Paranormal News. Um, and it's not the headline. We've already did that, folks. So. Unfortunately, you don't get to hear Justin's beautiful voice twice in a row. Uh, they can um, hear it right now. I'm talking oh, they can hear it. It's not the same, though. It's different <laughs> when you do the Paranormal Headline. You it's know? like it's a completely this. Different... I'm talking oh, like oh, I'm in the gosh. 1930s and 40s. Speaking of, I cannot believe how many times you did that on last week's show. <laughs> Uh, every time you did, I was just like, every time you do this, like, I got to fast forward, fast forward. I can't do this. I can't do it anymore. This is ridiculous. <laughs> um, I no, did know we're doing we, it a little bit, especially yeah, when I did bit. it for the headlines. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, it was a good experiment. It was fun. <laughs> um, but no, in, in some interesting news of about Paratruth Radio, uh, many of you know what our logo is. You should know if you're listening to the show because you, you're bound to see it. We have a change coming along. It's an upgrade. It's uh, it's bringing in a new – I like to say a new era for our show, our particular show. Um, you know, we're trying to – we've been trying to make some few small changes here and there to the show. Uh, some of them you see implemented week by week. We haven't done it all at one time, uh, but it's coming slowly and surely. And we decided to – to look at a few different ideas uh, on our own. Uh, and Justin and I were actually on the sh- uh, on Skype a f- week ago, uh, for those of you listening later, a few weeks ago. Um, and I just started messing with some stuff that I had, some, some uh, graphics and whatnot for, for a logo. And we realized that the logo that we're working with, the one that's going to be premiering in, in due time, uh, I think better represents our show. And I think it's a little more... I think professional for those of you listeners who might, you know, I think you're with us too. You know, I think that, I think our current one is our current logo is cool, but it it can be better. Regardless, I just want you guys to know that the retro is what we're going to call it. This retro logo that we have right now currently is still going to remain for you guys. Um, I know some of you really enjoy the logo, and we're glad that you do. Uh, and this is more so just for me and Justin, you know, our, our taste and stuff. So in the future, we're going to have T-shirts, hats, posters, et cetera, et cetera, coming at you. Uh, not next week, but soon enough. And I think that retro logo that we currently have is going to be available for some of those things if you guys really do want it. Mm. Um, but nonetheless, we do have a new logo coming soon. So hope you guys look forward to it. We'll be announcing that most likely on Facebook and probably on the show uh, the week of. So, uh, yeah, just look forward to that. Absolutely, absolutely. So a lot of great stuff coming up. Like I said to you guys uh, at the beginning of the show, we are on Fringe Radio Network now, mm-hmm. uh, along with the few podcasts that I said, Cast Them Off Radio. Uh, I did look it up. Uh, L.A. Marzulli's show is called Acceleration Radio, which I 
really don't understand because of I know his views and where he comes from, so I'm not understanding the name of the show. But maybe we can actually get him on and talk to him a little bit because he does have a new book out as well. Um, and um, definitely looking forward to everything coming up. I do want to let you guys know Eric and I had spitballed back and forth about a couple of things uh, other than the logo, and I will most definitely let you guys know what's going on with that as soon as it becomes pertinent to let you guys know that. So, Mm -hmm. all right. Any final thoughts? All right, folks. So in light of tonight's show, it's important just to remember some things. Some scientists claim that due to scientific laws, God cannot exist. And some individuals say that we should have faith in what we can see and touch. But does it not take just as much faith to believe there is intelligent beings flying around outer space at tremendous speeds and that they are the reason for our being? Regardless, everyone's view, opinion, or belief is allowed a fair trial. And in the end, the truth will be revealed. The only question that remains is whether you'll be standing on the right side of it. As always, my name is Eric. And I'm Justin. Peace. If you enjoyed this episode of Paratruth Radio and you would like to listen to it again, or are interested in listening to any of our past episodes, then you can find them at Stitcher, Blueberry, TuneIn, iTunes, Spreaker, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and the Fringe Radio Network. Or for a one-time fix of all of your Paratruth needs, simply drop in to paratruthradio.com. And of course, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram for brand new updates on our show every day. Finally, we love bringing you fresh, entertaining media each and every week, but we can't do it without you. So please check out our...